the Peterson phenomenon and the Tate phenomenon are, are worldwide. I think in the case of Peterson, it's been almost always a positive transformation. Hello and welcome to Offscript. My name is Stephen Edgington. Has liberalism led to happiness? Why are so many people feeling depressed and a lack of purpose in their life? To discuss these questions and more, I'm joined by James Orr, a professor of philosophy of religion at the University of Cambridge and the UK chairman of the Edmund Burke Foundation, which was behind the National Conservatism Conference held in London earlier this year. Do we live in an age of narcissism? Uh, that's quite a polemical way of putting it. Um, I think though we do live in what some people have called a therapeutic age. We live in the wake plausibly of what Philip Reef called in a prescient 1966 book, the triumph of the therapeutic. We think not so much of homo economicus, but homo psychologicus. And so you might say that we do live in an age where psychological well-being has acquired a kind of primacy that would be simply unintelligible to an earlier age. Is this a result of the liberal worship of the individual? You could well argue that it's the consummation and culmination of that long drift towards the human subject and away from a more God-centric way of understanding the world that begins in the 17th and 18th century. But I think that wouldn't quite explain the apparent acceleration of this phenomenon in relatively recent years. Um, and I think one's got a, a, a lot of it is to do with um, what you might call the process of disenchantment, the German sociologist Max Weber calls it um, disenchantment or entzauberung, literally demagicking. And the idea there is that the rise of science, the rise of reason, narrowly construed rationality, explicit conscious rationality, brought with it a kind of collapse of the sense of the world as, and our place in it as a place of mystery. That's the corrosion of religion, obviously, but also the erosion of the sort of customs and norms and conventions that organized our public life. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, if we'd been having this conversation 15 years ago, uh, at the high noon of the new atheist phenomenon, for example, would have said, as they were confidently, confidently predicting, science and religion has indeed, uh, science and reason has indeed displaced religion as an organizing horizon of human meaning. Now, I was skeptical of that back then, and I'm even more skeptical of it now, and I think a lot of people are, because it's not at all obvious that the post-Christian or post-religious progressive movement is on the side of science and reason. And it's much clearer that they're on the side of uh, emotion uh, and emotional validation, and I would say, to a degree, emotional incontinence and an overriding focus on psychological well-being above all else, construed, I think, in plainly ideological terms. There's an irony there, isn't there? Because if they're so obsessed with the mind and therapy and mental health, yet at the same time it seems, and you may disagree with this, that more people than ever, in a way, are depressed and feel a lack of purpose in their life. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And that would suggest that the tools that are being used to uh, relieve psychological suffering are, are simply not working. Uh, it could be that the, both the, the, the tools are not working, as it were, but also more likely that the diagnoses are simply mistaken. And I think that that's my worry. And, and I think, you know, if you have this shift from sin to syndrome, you know, this shift from religion to psychology, from worrying about the state of your soul to worrying about your neuroses, you are, as it were, shifting towards a, uh, a state, shall we say, of disempowerment. Uh, in a bygone religious era, you could do something about your sins. And within the Christian uh, soteriological salvific economy, you could, you could be, you, they were already forgiven. <laughs> You'd go to confession. You would, there were certain mechanisms and liturgies that you could appeal to that would relieve you of your sin, that would mean that the sin, your sin was not with you for the rest of your life. That's not the case once you have pathologized your, uh, m if you've turned your moral failure into mental failure, if you've turned uh, just, you know, ordinary, uh, the ordinary vicissitudes of human life into some fixed, 
condition and pathology that you can never escape from, then you've got a real problem, um, especially if there is no obvious medical way out of it, and there very rarely is. There's medication, but there isn't medicine, there isn't cures. But this is what they claim, isn't it? Because they, as you say, they're medicalizing perhaps what are spiritual crises in people's lives. So if one feels depressed and you go to a doctor, and your instinct is, first of all, your instinct is to go to a doctor about that. Many people's instinct is to do that. Yeah. And the doctor might prescribe you antidepressants. Yeah. I think eight million people in, in Britain are on antidepressants. Or your other alternative might be to do therapy. And I suspect that both of those sp supposed cures to depression uh, aren't working. No, they're clearly not working. Um, and part of the problem, I think, is that we are dealing with a deep conceptual confusion that is instilled and enshrined in the very phrase mental health. What are we talking about when we're talking about mental health? Well, I think what the phrase began as was effectively a transferred meta was a metaphor. That is to say, we were saying that psychological suffering, suffering is something like having a broken arm because there's pain there. And I think what began, though, as a metaphor has crystallized into something literal. So we actually think of the mind as something like a medical, like a broken arm. With, with chemical imbalances that must be corrected. That's the, that's the phrase that they use. Correct. Well, there are two theories. One is chemical imbalance and one is lack of uh, serotonin uptake. Both, I think, have now been convincingly discredited. And, um, the, and this whole debate happens downstream of a profound philosophical disagreement over whether or not we have minds at all. And this, is, this has been a problem since Plato, and, and so it, it would be news to the philosophy faculties <laughs> in universities that the mind-body problem has been solved. And we now know that the mind is just part of the brain, or just is the brain, and therefore it is, just like a broken arm, the object of medical scientific inquiry. But of course it's not. The ancients talked about therapeia, and when they talked about therapeia, they meant you could think of the therapy of, of the soul, but it meant something that was curative, it meant something that, uh, a relieving of suffering. And none of this, by the way, is to say that psychological suffering, deep psychological suffering, isn't real. Obviously it is. The objection is that we are thinking about it the wrong way. We're conceiving it the wrong way. As soon as we start to think of the mind as something like, you know, mental suffering as something like cancer, that needs to be solved and can in principle be solved by the medical sciences. We are, as it were, deep, we are already in the grip of a picture, as Wittgenstein says somewhere, a picture is holding us captive and we need to dissolve that picture and think of better ways of understanding psychological suffering. But in a post-religious era or in an era where we've dissolved all of the conventions and norms and conventions and cultural ways of dealing with suffering, um, that's not at all obvious, and particularly now, you know, it's very, very hard to deal with a young person who comes to, to, to you and says, I, I've got generalized anxiety disorder, GAD, a GAD. Well, what do they mean by that? Well, what it means is that they're anxious about exams around the corner. Uh, now, that's a totally normal way, <laughs> it's a totally normal res human response to an ordinary uh, uh, human experience. Um, there was a fascinating piece I read a few years ago in a, in a leading psychology journal in which researchers were trying to establish at which point, at what point grief turned into PTSD. You know, how long are you allow to, uh, to, to grieve your mother until it becomes problematic and patho pathological? I mean, this is just, uh, uh, it's, mad, uh, uh, <laughs> it's not a healthy way of thinking about human suffering. So the idea is, you know, three months, you know, really should have got over it by then, and now it's, it is PTSD, it's, it's trauma, it's trauma. And this is the result of this rational thinking, or the supposed rational thinking in, um, in medicine and just in our philosophy at the moment? Yes, I think that's right. I mean, its, it's origins obviously are, are in the rise of um, a pseudoscience, uh, psychoanalysis and psychology. Uh, I say pseudoscience, uh, let's just say the jury's out. When Freud got going 120 years ago, and some people think that the name Freud has uh, one letter, uh, is, is, is a misspelling, that there's one letter wrong in Freud, but let's just go with Freud's theses. Freud thought that he was engaged in something like a science, 
Uh, and still to this day, psychologists see themselves as scientists. That is to say, they start from the assumption that the psyche, the mind, the soul, in old fashioned, in the old fashioned language, uh, was simply another mystery that science would resolve sooner or later. A little bit like with God, you know, in the 17th century. We got rid of God, we don't need God anymore because we're making all these extraordinary scientific discoveries and, 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 we, and we don't have any need of that hypothesis, as Laplace is alleged to have said, but probably didn't to Napoleon. Um, so it's had, in my view, 120 years to con convince us that it's a science, and yet what do we see? Well, f at least four or five different schools of psychology, radically different and conflicting uh, uh, ways of approaching psychological problems. You don't get that in the sciences, in the natural sciences. If you did have that in the natural sciences, it would be a sign that something is going very wrong. So what you're seeing here is two things. You're seeing people being diagnosed for their feelings. So every kind of feeling that they have, whether it's anxiety or if they feel um, like ADHD is one of those other ones where the, you know, if they feel a bit restless then suddenly you must have ADHD. Mm. If you're anxious then suddenly you've got some major anxiety mm. issue. If you're depressed or feel unhappy you suddenly got PTSD or depression or whatever. So that's, that's on the one part. And then the second part of it is when they go to a therapist, the therapist tells them advice that may be misleading or may be wrong and I just want you to break down some of the kind of supposed cures that therapists might come up with. So they might say, be yourself. Mm -hmm. I know that this is the major kind of message that people are trying to um, put onto people. And they may try and affirm your beliefs. So they, uh, you know, when you look at um, supposed kind of gender transitioning, for example, among children, it's a very popular idea to say, well, actually, if someone says that they're born in the wrong body and they actually are a man or woman against their biological sex, then actually they must be, you know, telling the truth and, and, and we must affirm that. And that's just one, I suppose, extreme example of that affirmation culture. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the problem with the affirmation culture is that it masks instances of genuine and folds in instances of genuine psychological suffering and genuine psychological conditions that need treatment with ordinary feelings of um, human uh, unease at, at, at ordinary experiences. Um, and so in the case of gender dysphoria, I mean, that seems to be a fairly clear-cut case of psychological suffering where there are deeply held sincere beliefs that are plainly out of alignment with reality, uh, a little like anorexia. Anorexia is a, an instance of psychological suffering because arising from a belief that is not aligned with reality. And that is a cause for concern and it, needs, and, it, and it needs proper treatment, not emotional validation. Um, I mean, conversely, I noticed in the fifth edition, in fact, if you look at the evolution of, through the five editions of this manual in which it is effectively the Bible of what counts as a psychological disorder uh, since 1943, the first edition, when, it, when there were about 200, I think, identified. It's now far, it's got, the list has got longer and longer and longer and longer, and it's very interesting charting which ones have fallen out and which ones have been included. I think in the, f in the latest edition, in the fifth edition, substance abuse is now a psychological disorder. Now this is very interesting and it goes into debates that we probably don't want to touch on right now over the nature of addiction. The, the problem is really that it's, it's disempowering, that is to say if you've got this condition there's no way you can really escape it, you've got to, you've got to live with it, there's no way out. But that speaks to a broader addiction, trend, doesn't which it? Which is a completely fake people are psychological, it's a completely fake their disease, own issues fake illness, but it was one that wider so suited society. the moods of the time. It's a lack of responsibility, isn't it? Well, of and course, a poor guy can't, rather he just say, can't well, help tumbling into bed with thousands of women. I mean, there's a poor guy when you whatever, have sympathy for whatever, And that's of course, because of you know, racism that, or goodness, sexism or to slip, course, something else that has true. nothing to do with um, me. And this is a phenomenon. It's a, yeah, and you might say, I mean, I note that in addition to the ones you've mentioned, one of the nine protected characteristics under Section 4 of the 2010 Equality Act is disability. And increasingly, that protected characteristic is being extended to include mental disabilities and the long shopping list of what everyone and uh, the, or the, the, the clinical professionals are now recognizing as disorder. So you can see the, the, the scope for potential abuse and bad actors to come in or even sincere actors coming in and being convinced that they do have some syn syndrome 
that's more than just ordinary uh, human experience, a response to ordinary experiences, or some sort of moral failure, something that they could in fact put right in their lives and live, uh, and live a better life. And now that's been, you can now weaponize that through the discrimin the new, our new constitution, the Ecology Act 2010 and its associated, um, uh, its associated codes. It's fascinating because I, I just read Crystal Coldwell's The Age of Entitlement, excellent book discussing civil rights in America and how since the 60s America's, America has formed a new constitution based on the Civil Rights Act in 1964. And I think in Britain we've got some amazing similarities. You mentioned the Equality Act of 2010 where all the incentive structures are there so that young people or anyone really would want to be uh, diverse in some way. So they call they say neurodiversity. That's the example, isn't it? So one uh, one would want to be uh, in some way disabled or a minority group because there are certain advantages in that. And I think all of the incentive structures now for young people as they're growing up and going through the career structure and the career ladder, etc., are to somehow plead some kind of victimization status. Do, do you agree with me? Hard to disagree. Uh, Caldwell's book is excellent. I wish he devoted a bit more than a chapter to that thesis, but there's a, another version, a longer version of that thesis in Richard Hanania's recently published Origins of Woke. Somebody needs to write that book for the UK context, because I think you're absolutely right uh, to draw the analogy. What we see in the 1998 Human Rights Act, uh, crystallized in the 2010 Equality Act, is in effect the emergence of a new constitution, a new constitutional order, and a radically new way of thinking about what it is to be uh, British, what it is to be a member of the national family. Uh, up, until, uh, up until the late 90s, up until the Blair government, really we were, we were free subjects with certain inalienable liberties. And this was a vision that we exported all around the world and which, uh, which has had a, an enormously positive impact in, in my view. We're now, as it were, thinking of ourselves first and foremost as um, members of classes that should be protected from discrimination by the state. That's the sort of the drift. I'm not sure that that was intended by Parliament. I don't think there was some dark plot in Downing Street in the Blair era to bring this about. And I think probably if you pressed Blair, he would regret that, that this outcome. But that is where we are, that we're now, as it were, carved up into these confected demographic segments, as if the most important thing about a person is what their sexual orientation is or what their eth ethnicity is. That's the starting point. And so later on, it's, it's very difficult to then understand downstream what it might be to be a member, to, to, have, to have something in common with our fellow citizens. And if that's not the starting point, if the starting point is my, I, I occupy a different demographic space funda in, in the most fundamental sense, from, uh, from anything we could possibly have in common, that is a recipe for social division and catastrophe. Do you think that the outcome of, of this has been essentially one group, white men, have been placed on their shoulders the burden of original sin, and they are the ones who are blamed for all sorts of oppression of women, of minorities, when you go throughout all of history, the kind of reimagining of our entire society and our entire, and our entire kind of hi historical um, thesis has now been imagined as a story of oppression where you have white men, straight white men to be more specific, able-bodied straight white men um, as the oppressors and everyone else as the kind of oppressed. And what, what's the outcome of that today? I think that's probably true. You know, looking across an ocean at the coastal elites of the United States. I'm not sure if that's r really true uh, of what's happening in the UK. One can see elements of it, of course, and one tends to see the most egregious elements of it surfacing uh, in the university towns and in London and uh, the Telegraph and others do very good work at exposing that quickly. And, and, and I think on balance it's not a I don't know what the polling is on this, but I don't think it's a widespread view. It's probably a view that's more intensely held among the young, partly because of the state of secondary education and the abuse of the 1996 Education Act that prohibits political partisanship. Uh, that, that, that effectively we're, we're seeing plainly partisan curricular content in the schools, and that's clearly affecting things. I, I mean, I think the deeper problem is that as soon as you start thinking of a society in terms of of, of rights bearers, which is a relatively alien intrusion into 
the British way of thinking about law. You then uh, have a very difficult time working out how you rank different kinds of rights. If you're sorting your citizens into nine protected characteristics, you are inevitably, with, with no accompanying explanation in the statute as to how these nine protected characteristics are supposed to get on with each other, you're just, they must get on. Thou, shal thou shalt ensure. Every public body shall ensure that they will get on under, the, on, on, under the public sector equality duty. You're making, uh, you're setting up a nightmare for the judges, uh, and you're effectively setting up uh, you, what, what the law will do is simply underwrite whatever emerging hierarchy, whatever emerging hierarchy the uh, elite ideology is, um, is deciding on in terms of how those rights are ranked. And I think that's what you're starting to see, and no doubt you probably are seeing more, more claims from certain protected characteristics and discrimination. You're certainly seeing a sort of um, you're certainly seeing a sort of an emergent elite consensus as to how these rights are ranked, and that, and then the law can simply be weaponized in the courts to give effect to that hierarchy of rights. Now, I should say, you know, I know that there are some who would want to do away with the Equality Act altogether. In some moments, I, I share that conviction. On the other hand, we've seen that, you know, if one of the protected characteristics is philosophical belief, and we've seen a very important victory in the case of Maya Falstater, which um, asserts that gender critical beliefs are, gen uh, are, are um, protected under the Equality Act. Now, it's not the judgment was not quite as clear and robust as it might have been, but there is, as it were, a, 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 a means, a sort of to, to um, find to secure a kind of defence against the worst consequences of the Equality Act within the Equality Act itself. So we need to be sort of careful what we wish for. But in my view, doing a, you know radically rewriting the Equality Act 2010, certainly doing away with the public sector equality duty, certainly looking very hard at the Human Rights Act 1998, and the power that a foreign court in Strasbourg has over some absolutely fundamental policy decisions that should be made by a democratically uh, elected government. M that's something that really, really does need looking at. Uh, that's not to say doing away with human rights. It's to say that human rights is not the same thing as human rights law. Why not get away with uh, human rights? I don't know. <laughs> well, I would say get rid of the Human Rights Act, to just, just remove it. Some would then say, well, we have to replace it with something else. I'm not so sure. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a specialist here. But look, you know, pre-1998, uh, the United Kingdom was not some crazy anarchic despotism in which nobody, <laughs> everyone, was being, everyone was being persecuted. In fact, the Human Rights Act 1998 didn't actually come into a force until October 2000. It wasn't as if that, those intervening two years were just it's going to be absolute bedlam. Not at all. In fact, the common law has always handled, has co covered almost all of these I mean, the Magna Carta protects us, <laughs> protects our, so many of our basic freedoms, there's a few bits that are still remaining. The Offences Against the Person Act, 1861, grievous bodily harm, actual bodily harm, murder and so on and so forth. All that is, was, was dealt with and was, uh, and was in place. But this is the Cultural Revolution coming in and saying all of this is irrelevant and actually our rights began in uh, 1998 and without that, w you know, there's nothing. That's right. It, it is a cultural revolution that is weaponized through legal means. So um, what we're seeing is, in effect, the codification of a constitutional framework. We have famously do not have never had a codified constitution. Part of our constitution is written. Some people think it's, there's no written constitution. There are actually large parts of it that are written down, Magna Carta, for example. But broadly speaking, we have not got a constitutional framework in the sense that the United States does or the, or the French do. But we now are having something very close to that. And the differences from the United States, for all the disagreements they have over the, and the politicization of the Supreme Court, we have no choice over who sits in Strasbourg except for one. I mean, there are now 46 judges. Uh, and so there's no, there are no mechanisms of democratic accountability. And the problem there is that since 1978, the judges in Strasbourg have adopted this doctrine of the convention as a living instrument and taking you know, uh, enormous liberties with their, with, with their powers uh, and effectively paralyzing and, and, and choking the uh, policy making functions and, and the legislative functions of a democratically accountable um, government and parliament. I want to come back to this issue of the hierarchy of oppression and particularly 
white young men. And I think this is a, a real phenomenon that you've experienced as someone who has spoken with and, and dealt with Jordan Peterson a lot. You know, he's a very kind of popular figure amongst that group of people. Obviously, you're involved in the National Conservatism Conference, where I imagine, you know, a lot of young kind of white men went to that and are interested in, the, interested in these ideas. And you're also a professor of uh, philosophy of religion in, at Cambridge, so you must meet a lot of young people and, and have those experiences. Do you see a crisis among that group of people? Mm. Well, um, I, I don't see it up close, partly because uh, the percentage of white working class lads who come to Cambridge is scandalously low. Um, now, I don't think that's Cambridge's fault necessarily. We, we can't make white working class lads apply, and they're not applying in the numbers that we would want and expect them to so be. So it's an issue applying. of like aspiration? I think there is uh, probably, there's certainly an, an issue of aspiration, and there's probably you know, the universities put a lot of work into um, outreach and, and access, and a lot of that's good, and, and I, I try and take part in that whenever I can. Um, but that is aimed at so-called diverse groups in your mind? I think the, I suspect the evidence would show that yes, it's disproportionately weighted to ethnic minorities and those who are perceived to need um, a, a prod, a push, and maybe they do, but it's clear that the white working class lads do as well. Um, now, I just, I just don't know what the stats are. My, my suspicion is that if you did a sort of survey right across all the, all the top, the Russell Group universities, you probably would see that disproportionate emphasis on, on, on outreach to non-white ethnic minorities. But we've seen, if you look at the statistics, for example, on education, um, sort of the grades that that group is getting young white working class men, you know, it's very, very low compared to lots of other groups in the UK. And there's also, as I, as I mentioned, some very, very popular figures who are coming up with solutions for these people. So yeah. Jordan Peterson is one, and I think, you know, I've interviewed him, and, and, and he's a fascinating guy, but also Andrew Tate, he's also yeah. a phenomenon. Um, you know, many people will, will be aware of him as well. So do you accept my thesis that this group is facing a kind of existential crisis, a feeling of purposelessness, a feeling that um, they are the people who are almost being, you know, as I said earlier, being told that all of the burden of original sin is on their backs. Yeah, I, I think that's probably right. Um, I, I mean, the Peterson phenomenon and the Tate phenomenon are, are worldwide phenomena, and it's difficult to see how it plays out in the UK uh, in, in particular. But yes, you get these, these sort of um, Pied Piper figures who are clearly um, speaking to uh, the dispossessed, dispossessed white working class um, demographics in, a, in an incredibly, uh, I think in the case of Peterson, a compelling way and in a positive way and in a life enhancing way. Certainly talking to some of the people he's, he's, he's had an impact on, it's been almost always a positive transformation. Um, uh, uh, with Tate, I mean, he's clearly I don't really know much about him, but he's, he's clearly a repugnant individual. So the fact that, you know, we have some very dark pipe pipers emerging is, is deeply troubling. And, uh, no, it's, it's, uh, 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 and it's a sign that something's gone very badly wrong. But what he's saying is people shouldn't be ashamed of being a man, they mm. should be masculine, um, you know, and this very much goes against that mainstream mm. feminine view mm. of men that has dominated the airwaves for, for many years now. Do you accept that? Yeah, I think that's probably right. I mean, you, well, yes, it is right. I mean, there's, we live in an age of broadly, an age of androgyny, and in an age in which, um, uh, in, a way, in an age that you would expect to arise, granted certain strict egalitarian ways of thinking about society, um, where human beings are basically completely fungible and whether or not they belong to a particular country or whether or not they belong to a particular sex is completely, uh, completely irrelevant. So emancipation for women in the 1970s meant um, being able to live lives that were as close to men as possible. And as it were, part of that emancipation brought with it a kind of feminizing of, the, of male traits and the male impulse. Now, no doubt there was some positive, positive uh, uh, effects there. But yes, this sort of, um, in a way, a kind of it's a war on, on, on natural diversity, a war on the a sort of objective distinctions and differences between men and women, and between 
uh, well and objective cultural differences between members of different diff different countries. So uh, yeah, I mean that brings with it a kind of you know a flattening of society and an inability to think and respond to objective differences. Certainly, I think between men and women, you're seeing the war between the sexes beginning to and a kind of mutual mistrust, which is which is deeply damaging to to society and to, to, to society's future. Well, this idea of toxic masculinity has become a very popular concept. Yeah. And that's a good example of this. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Um, but men and women are different. Men can be bad, men can be good. Women can be bad, women can be good. Uh, there must be such a thing as toxic femininity. Do you think that happiness is the ultimate goal in life? No. I think happiness is something that uh, will arise only in the pursuit of other enriching goals. If you make happiness your final horizon, your final organizing horizon, you're almost guaranteed not to get it. Um, but, the, but, my, but my main worry there, by uh, well, invoking the term happiness, is in itself, happiness is a horizon of the therapeutic age. It is a basically meaningless word. It's a quite a new word um, in its original sense, uh, in, its, in, its, um, in its current sense, I should say. Um, I think the, the origin of happiness is, is, in, is in this notion of chance. We still have it in that phrase, a happy coincidence, that was a happy, or happenstance. So the word happy is relates to happens, and there's a sense of randomness in it, a sense of sort of just fortuity or, or you know, luck. Um, and that's not at all, well, it's not a healthy way <laughs> of really, sort of happiness has this very, very kind of thin, slightly random um, uh, 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 application, and that's, as is often the case, you have a phrase or a word that emerges that becomes very, very widespread precisely because it means absolutely nothing. Um, it, you know, it's this, this weird phenomenon. And, uh, but, and, and I think that's, that's the case with happiness and being kind and you know, being happy. These, these are phrases that are vacuous and precisely because they're vacuous, they do, you know, they do the rounds. Um, uh, there's no notion really of happiness in theological traditions and in, in the Christian tradition. I mean, the, the, there's the word makarios in the New Testament that is sometimes translated as happy, uh, happy are they who, but that's, I, I, in the Greek, that Jesus' words means something, in the Sermon on the Mount, means something much more like blessedness, you know, blessed are those. You know. Similarly, in the, in the Greek context, Aristotle, the word that's translated happiness is eudaimonia, which is a strange word. It's almost, a, it means that you've got a good daimon on your shoulders. You've got a kind of, sort of, you've got a kind of guardian angel. Uh, originally, that seems to be what it meant, but in Aristotle's sense, it means a sort of full, full or fully orbed human flourishing, and uh, that is, say, a person who exercises reason and and habituates certain uh, positive traits that become virtues over time, and exercises temperance and moderation, values friendship, and so on and so forth. Um, and we don't have that kind of moral vocabulary. We don't have that sort of moral framework uh, in in a more globalized world where we're having to appeal to notions like rights, like human rights, that, uh, that, are, that are bland precisely because they have to be universal and they, they are untethered from any particular moral cultures or any um, particular webs of customs and conventions. This is a critique famously leveled by Alastair McIntyre in his great book After Virtue in 1981. Now you deal with a lot of students as a professor at Cambridge and uh, I know that you have a sort of camp where you <laughs> house some students, so you must deal with kind of a lot of young people. Um, maybe you don't, I don't know. I suspect you do. Um, can you talk a bit about your experiences of, of them and your kind of assessment of, of their philosophy and of, of you know, in, t in the context of everything we've discussed today, how do you view that sort of young mindset, as it were? Well, I get an interesting perspective. I mean, I'm incredibly spoiled because I get some of the brightest kids in the country uh, coming to do theology and, and philosophy with me and, and my colleagues. So I, I'm, getting, I'm getting quite a skewed view of, as it were, uh, any given cohort or any given generation. Um, and I've had almost, you know, in the few years I've been at Cambridge, not that long, I haven't, don't think I've had any problems at all with it, with any with any students, and they've been um, 
So they're not entitled, they're not depressed, they're not coming up with talking about ADHD and... Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, deliberately and, and rightly don't have any real kind of pastoral engagement with, with, with students, with, with most, certainly with, with most undergraduates that tends to be dealt with within their colleges and their whole, halls of accommodation. Um, but I, I mean, one does see certain, certain patterns and one, one's definitely aware of uh, the, the rise of a certain kind of um, a sort of emergent tyrannical impulse over particular areas, you know, history and heritage, trans, of course, climate. There are certain sort of no-go areas. The war between the sexes, I think, must have some kind of expression on campus. Um, I'm almost certain, I mean, I, I know that it does. And, and, and makes, makes things very difficult. We have, you know, we have some brilliant students who live in our sort of kind of compounds and they, they are, um, broadly speaking, I suppose most of them would be conservative, small c conservative. Uh, some, are not, some are not Brits, some are from other parts of the world. And they probably would, if you press them, think of themselves as kind of refugees from the revolution. Um, and and um, but but I don't think the revolution is as intense, anything like as intense as it is as it clearly is across the Atlantic in the Ivy League universities. I think actually, you know, the the, the health of of the universities in 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 the UK, certainly in Cambridge and and in Oxford, where I've where I've been, um, is is pretty good actually. I mean, it's uh, there are obviously egregious moments. There are scandals. There were tantrums over Jordan Peterson from from a few of a minority of students and, and colleagues, but um, th I wouldn't say that's the dominant majority. But clearly, these American ideas are having some impact and influence in the UK culturally, and as as one would expect. Well, I've often said, you know, I was a Brexiteer since I was been a Brexiteer since I was thirteen. Um, you know, I, I've Brexit was a great moment for me. I, I think I was. I, I don't think it was for many of my colleagues. Um, but, but, you know, I don't see the point in, in winning back our political sovereignty from Brussels when we've surrendered our cultural sovereignty to Harvard, to New York, and to Silicon Valley. And that is the next great task for British conservatism, identifying an expression of conservatism that is national, that is pro-nation. And part of that, I ha think, means questioning, if not severing, the special relationship and asserting our, the primacy of our culture, our cultural norms, which, in effect, America has uh, given expression to and gave expression to in the 18th century through, through its revolution against the crown. And we've got a lot to be proud of, and a lot, it, both in terms of our culture and in terms of our values and conventions and norms, and we should be prizing those, not surrendering them to uh, the coastal elites of the United States. Let's get into that, and I really want to sort of break that down, go back to the Second World War. But before we do, just one last question about Cambridge. The academic atmosphere in Cambridge, obviously, you know, the kind of purpose of a university is the pursuit of truth. But there are some people who say the academic atmosphere within many Western universities in Britain, America, and other places, that purpose has been replaced with something else, with other goals, yeah. you know, goals of justice, goals of a sort of, um, you know, the pursuit, almost like a kind of church-like attitude. And, you know, when you go back to the uh, 19th century and how Cambridge and Oxford and other institutions viewed their purpose, it wasn't about kind of rationalism and, and the pursuit of truth or science or whatever. Actually, it was, it was more, these, th those uh, kind of purposes and motives were more almost religious. But today, I suspect, and this is the argument that some people make, that kind of religious nature within the universities has, has crept back, in particular, as I say, for the, in the pursuit of social justice and other kind of other goals that aren't truth. Do you feel that the academic atmosphere in Cambridge and the, the purpose of academics and the purpose of universities in the UK, um, can you just assess that? Mm. Well, it's a subtle historical analogy because, you know, up until 1828, you couldn't teach or be a student at Oxford or Cambridge if you were not if you did not accept the Anglican understanding of transubstantiation. And it wasn't until, I think, 1871 that you could, in the 1828 Act meant that the students could, could, could come who didn't sign up to that. And, and what that did is it, it, it created intellectually suffocating cultures, which themselves opened up um, pressure valves in the form of the self-consciously secular foundations uh, here in London, King's College London. UCL and so on and so forth, and and so we, we saw that sort of effect, and I think we may have something similar 
uh, happening in in the West right now. Certainly in the States, perhaps not 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 in the UK. Look, it's never been the case that a university should only have the truth. You know. Um, the passing on of truth, the preservation of, uh, of truth, and the pursuit of truth as its sole and exclusive objective. But it should be the organizing horizon. Um, you know, there are other ways that we justify the uh, taxpayer funds that are, that are lavished upon us. For example, we, um, we perform an important credentialing function. That is to say, we, we'll, we will take bright, l bright young people at 18, and after we'll give them a rigorous intellectual formation for over three years, and give them some tough exams, and if we Give them, give them a particular degree, that is going to accelerate and help the professions to select the right, the right people and so on. But it's true that in the States and now increasingly in the UK, there is an emerging conflicting vision of what a university is for, which says that the primary goal of the university is not the pursuit of truth and the, uh, the, 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 the passing on of truth and the preservation of truth, but really the psychological well-being of all of its members, that's, that's the absolute primacy. Uh, this is the kind of coddling vision that Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff uh, uh, um, describe in their, in their 20, 2017 book. And so we're coming full circle in the conversation, as it were. We can see the therapeutic revolution, as it were, begin to express itself in, in the university campus. But it's you know, weaponized with, um, with a new, as it were, a new ideology, um, with its own history its own sacred texts, its own high priests, or more normally high priestesses. Um, a, a, and so something analogous to a, 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 a sort of religious movement emerging and corroding and killing our universities. As I said, I just want to stress this again, it's not as bad in the UK. There are lots of reasons to be hopeful, not least the government's action uh, uh, in the 2019 manifesto and its expression in the Freedom of Speech Higher Education Act. Uh, 2023, which will come properly into force next year. Uh, I'm ho I'm hopeful, quietly hopeful, that that will have a salutary effect on 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 the sort of suffo ideologically suffocating atmosphere of some university campuses. You talk about the credentialism of Cambridge and other institutions in terms of helping people get on in their career. And obviously, as a professor, you want people to go to university, etc. But I just want to say, as someone who didn't go to university, I think you don't have to go. I think there are so many other ways of, of learning, of getting knowledge, and it's so expensive. And there's so many reasons I think you don't have to go to university. But I don't know. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. OK, let's talk about um, America. So. In the Second World War, Peter Hitchens makes an argument that we were invaded by GIs and they spread their culture and their ways um, among the British population. And there are also others, conservatives, who say that Britain lost that war. Do you think we lost the Second World War? It, in some senses, that's plainly true. I'm not sure I buy the Hitchens thesis. I mean, you know, the GIs arrived in what, 1942, and left in 1944 and didn't stay around that much uh, that longer. Well, they married a lot of our women. Maybe married a lot, but but yeah, I, I, I maybe you know, to, to brought them over to the states. I, I don't know. I'm not convinced of that. I think this, but though I am convinced that we've surrendered our cultural sovereignty to the United States and probably did that a long time ago. But I think it's much more plausible to suppose that it's the forms of of, of American culture and the dominance of global American culture. In particularly in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, through the emergence of color TV and other forms of media uh, in, in, in the last 20, 30 years. So that seems to be a, a, lot, a much more plausible mechanism for, for that invasion and that kind of colonization. Um, it's absolutely true that, uh, you know, I think it's almost undeniable that Roosevelt's intentions were to ensure that we uh, were financially crippled as a result of the uh, extraordinary Lend-Lease scheme, which was only, I think, our debts to the US for the Second World War were only paid off as recently as 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at, um, you know, American involvement in, uh, in sort of, you know, European crises, you know, they arrive, what, within the last 18 months of the First World War, they join the Second World War n only because Hitler disastrously declares war on them after Pearl Harbor when he didn't have to. Chances are if Hitler had not declared war uh, in December 1941 on America, they, America would have preferred to fight in a single theater at a time. So it's not at all clear uh, that, that, uh, that America would have joined in 1941 when, when in fact 
it did. You look at Suez, 1956, they left us in the lurch there. Look at the Falklands. Um, uh, th they, were not, uh, that they were not quick I in backing us over the Falklands. Uh, so they did I, help in some ways. I'm going to defend they, the Americans here. Well, well, Reagan helped in some yeah. ways. But, and, and indeed, Roosevelt probably wanted to in 1941, but he was up against a very vigorous uh, sort of America first movement that was very skeptical of foreign intervention. Suez was a great example of where the Americans abandoned us. I mean, they basically threatened to destroy our economy um, if we didn't pull out, and, and obviously we had to in the end. Yeah, with friends like that, who needs enemies? <laughs> um, when we're looking at the Second World War as a kind of foundational, a kind of the foundation of our view of evil in Auschwitz, uh, with the Nazis, what has the impact of that been on conservatism? Gosh, that's a difficult question. Um, Look, the, it's a matter of you know, recorded history that the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights is signed in 1948 as a result of the committee put together by Eleanor Roosevelt that was itself a decision that flowed from the troubling, um, that troubling feature of the Nuremberg Trials that made it very difficult for Robert Jackson and the Allied prosecutors to land much of a blow on the, the Nazi war criminals because their defense was, what laws did we break? And in fact, it was not at all clear as the trial went on that they had broken many laws, that they're uh, international or domestic. They were scrupulous legislators. Hitler's state of emergency declared in 1933 effectively gave him total power, but they were, it was constitutionally vested, as it were, within, within the, um, the Enabling Act. The Enabling Act, exactly right. And so the sort of, I think the horror of that immediate, was, was an immediate trigger and motivation for the United Nations, Nations Declaration on Human Rights, which itself provided, almost word for word, the European Convention on Human Rights, which we basically drafted. It was David Maxwell Fife, the English jurist who came to Jackson's rescue in the Nuremberg trials. As a Scot, I mean, he drafted it as a government, and we were the first to sign it in March 1951. But the British government was reluctant to um, uh, give it any kind of treaty force, and in, in the end it, it did. Now, so if you just start with those, with, with you know, that fairly straightforward history of, from 1946 to 19, 1951, what you see is that the kind of uh, that something like a universal moral order, in as much as one accepts that a rights-based regime and human rights is, is the primary currency of the, moral, of the moral economy, then it's absolutely right that, that this is a moral framework that emerges and is shaped by the, um, the shadow of the Second World War. But I'm going to press you again. What impact has that had on conservatism? Well, the th it, that's a very difficult question to answer because notoriously every conservative movement that is actually conservative is, um, expresses its own, its own nations, its own cultures, norms and conventions and well, so in on. Britain, I mean. In Britain. Well, um, I think, you know, uh, it's, it, it's probably been, um, I mean, I'm not really sure. There's certainly there's a mythography that emerges from the Second World War. That is to say, the, the benchmark for what counts as evil is, 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 is you know, to be a Nazi. And, and it is bizarre the way in which the language of the Second World War and the language of the 1930s is with us still, almost 100 years later. Um, and that the association of conservatives with you know, being a, 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 you know, just a little bit closer to the center of a spectrum uh, uh, who, whose side is occupied by national socialists. I mean, that is just a bizarre, I mean, such a bizarre way of thinking. Um, but I'll give you an example. Mm. You're, you're involved in the NatCon, National Conservatism yeah. Organization, movement, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And they have faced accusations of being Nazis, of being far right. Yeah. And conservatives have had to deal with this ever since the Second World War, yes. of being associated with and yeah. compared to yeah. the Nazis. Yeah. And what I suspect that that has had a major impact on how conservatives mm -hmm. have reacted mm -hmm. on the conservative philosophy. And if you read someone like Yoram Hazoni, he makes the argument that conservatives, base, that conservatism as an idea, as a philosophy, 
basically collapsed after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And what became the dominant philosophy, even among conservative parties, the Republicans, conservatives in the UK, mm -hmm. was liberalism. Mm -hmm. And liberalism became that dominant, um, that kind of monoculture mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. And I think now we're seeing, almost with national conservatism, mm -hmm. a rise again of the, those more conservative values and conservative beliefs. So I'm sort of answering yeah. the question for you. No, I, I, I see exactly <laughs> what you mean. And, and yes, it's an interesting, um, it's interesting to call a movement nation, like national conservatism to associate it with, with the Nazis when our intellectual godfather is in many ways uh, an Israeli-American uh, and a lot of our team is based in uh, Jerusalem. Indeed, a lot of our team are Orthodox Jews. I would have to, you know, when organizing the National Conservatism Conference, you know, Sabbath was, <laughs> everything stopped. Um, but you're so obviously not Nazis, mm. but, but people associate um, nationalism yeah. With the Nazis, yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it's true that 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 the that, that it is another N word, isn't it? Um, but but only applied to certain substantives. So, you know, we're happy to glorify the National Health Service. We're happy to talk about the National Trust, even if we might have some concerns about those two uh, glorious institutions. Um, but yes, yeah, something about attaching the word national or, or thinking of thinking of sovereignty and pro nation sentiment. Um, uh, in, in some kind of political way, and as opposed to a harmless cultural way, or, or in a way that reinforces um, a sort of socialist mindset, is, is, sort of, is completely anathema, and I think probably does reflect the um, total victory of liberalism and uh, in the wake of the Second World War. I mean, someone said somewhere the other day, I was listening to, to an interview, that the, 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 you can summarize the Second World War in three words. America invades Europe. It's almost like, and, and I think the argument goes, it's almost like because you're a con national conservative, the kind of logical conclusion or outcome of your philosophy is Auschwitz. That, mm. That's almost the argument that people mm -hmm. that people are make, but they don't make that same argument on the left in terms of no. communism no. and the gulag and the terrible evils that happened under Stalin, for example. So there's a hip hypocrisy there, isn't there? Yeah, I'm sure there are double standards. And, and you know, I wouldn't really dignify those inferences with, with argument and in fact I never really bother responding to them um, these days everybody's a Nazi if everybody's a Nazi no one is a Nazi um, and there's a kind of profound sort of illiteracy and it's strange that it has this kind of currency so has it lost left. that currency now well I think it I mean I think it has I mean speaking for you know I can't speak for the 60 speakers we had at NatCon we had a huge range of people almost entirely Brits, they're all very you know, establishment figures, brilliant writers, academics, journalists, politicians, cabinet ministers. Um, I mean, they're all fairly inured to it anyway. I mean, I think there was, there was some surprise at the reaction. But I think it's become such a sort of, you know, common, a common trope, a common response that, that people, that it will, in the end, I mean, people will sim simply become completely immune to it and it becomes just, just, just a sort of kind of name calling. It's like a kind of, weird, almost autistic reflex. I want to finish the interview by talking about pessimism and optimism. Mm -hmm. And as someone who is interested in conservative ideas and uh, contemporary politics, if you like, mm. there is a tendency uh, for me to feel tempted by doomerism mm -hmm. and to be tempted by feeling incredibly pessimistic mm -hmm. about the future mm -hmm. and the current state of Britain and America. Um, are you generally optimistic or pessimistic about the future? I am approximate pessimist but I'm a, what they call, an, what I might call, say, call myself as a, an eschatological optimist. Eschatological being that theological term for, you know, the end of the world and judgment day. I mean, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm a church goer, and so my ultimate hopes are not fixed on this world uh, and, and the kind of um, the, the passing vicissitudes of this world. But approximately, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic and and um, I think things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, conservatives have always had a healthy pessimism uh, because they've te always got human nature right, whereas the left, I think, has always got human, tended to get human nature wrong. Um, we're aware of our moral fragility, our fallibility, our fallenness. You might want to introduce a few more F words into that. Um, and so this is not a surprise, I think, for anyone with a kind of conservative temperament. It's certainly not a surprise to any Christian who's committed to the doctrine and uh, the, the idea of original sin. As G.K. Chesterton said, it's the easiest Christian teaching to, 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 to believe, to sign up to, because there's evidence of it all around. But if one takes this pessimism too far, 
one might fall into despair. And I just worry that some people do fall into this loop where you, uh, sus you feel powerlessness. You don't, you, you, know, you don't feel like you can change yeah. the future, but I don't think that's right. No, I don't think that's right. And um, you know, I think uh, Spengler has this image somewhere of uh, the Roman soldier who doesn't leave his post at Pompeii and gets literally petrified. He's not running, but he's, well, this is my post. And OK, I can see the lava's coming, but I haven't got orders to do anything else. Um, and so you know, we, one should keep Keep, keep that posture and, um, and, 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 and die on the hills that we should be dying on and fighting the battles that we ought to be fighting and picking the battles that we ought to be fighting, or b picking, uh, not leaving them out. I mean, the number of times, if I had a pound for every time somebody said, well, pick your battles, are you really sure this is the one I'm fighting? I, I'd be a very rich man. Um, most of the time when somebody's saying that, you ought, to, you ought to pick it and just go ahead and get, get your shield, get your sword and get stuck in. Excellent. Thank you very much, James Orr, for joining us. Pleasure to be with you, Steve.